swings and misses. Strike three. And the Mets have defeated the Los Angeles Angels to start this series in Anaheim. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Shea Station podcast. This is episode 40. Oh, 74. Excuse me. It is June 14th. The Mets have taken two out of three from the Angels. They are finally done with their West Coast trip from hell. And if you're watching on YouTube, you'll probably notice that we're in a different studio today. Uh, Morning with John Boys taking place as we speak in Studio B. So we got bumped up. We're prime time. We're main stage. I'm joined by my co-host, Jeremy Blevins. Jerry, how you doing? Hope you had a good weekend, my man. How are things? I did have a good weekend. Uh, strange one. I, I cheated on the Mets, went back to my, my first yeah. love in the A's, did some radio work. I spent the day or the whole weekend in Cleveland in the, in the, in the radio booth, uh, in the press box area, looking down at a game for the first time. It was wild. Yeah. Some tough games to call there though. I felt bad for, uh, Ooh. yeah, I was, rough. well, they did. They, they, they got to a 10, 10 game losing streak in dramatic fashion, blew it in the end. And then they won and ended the streak in dramatic fashion by by winning at the end as well. So it was they've got a let's just say covering the Mets is a lot easier because the team is really, really, really good. Uh, that could be a tough run for them at times, but it was fun, man. I loved it. I enjoyed it. It was nice to to snap back to my Bay Area, you know, phase. Yeah, I mean, that's your roots, you know? You can't just forget about them. And they loved you. Everyone loved Jerry on the air. Uh, did you get the follow back from Vince? Did I did. Okay. I did. My radio partner, <laughs> the man that I've known since 2007, uh, Vince Catronio, uh, like made some comment on Twitter, and I realized he wasn't even following me. I was like, Brutal. dude, I thought we were, we were partners. Brutal turn for my man. <laughs> yeah, we, I got to meet Vince when we went to spring training. Super nice dude. Oh, that's uh, right. And Dom. Yeah. His and son Dom, yeah. Works with the Dom Brewers. was great. Uh, so that was a lot of fun. Hopefully our, our A's turn it around. We're kind of like a co-A's pod. I think we root for them for sure. I, I like I said, I'm, I've never hid my love for the A's and the Mets. They're they're two separate but equal parts of my my heart. Um, I just, I love Oakland. They're, they're the ones that gave me my shot. Uh, they traded for me. They let me you know, grow in the game and uh, I'll forever love them. Yeah. So, I mean, back to our Mets a little bit. The, uh, the Let's se- do it. The season ended on Thursday, which is really unfortunate because the Mets lost two in a row. Uh, and then they came back and they won two of three. Now the season's back on. Uh, they're the second team in baseball to reach 40 wins. The other one being those New York Yankees. The first time in MLB history that the Mets and Yankees are the first two teams to 40 wins. Pretty cool that New York's running shit this year. Uh, and we got three fun games to talk about. The Game 2 curse is alive and well. But what do you think? Should we dive in? Let's dive right in. Let's yeah, you, you mentioned right. the the dreaded end of the road trip. It was the second consecutive West Coast road trip. We went 5-5. Five and five. I say it all the time. You want to split on the road and win series at home. And what did they do? They split on the road. I'm happy it's over. I'm sure they're happy it's over. And we're back. Hell yeah. All right, let's get it going for game one. The Mets went to Anaheim and they welcomed back a familiar face that we hadn't seen in a month's time. Tyler McGill took the mound once again. He went three and a third, two earned runs allowed. He threw 64 pitches in his first start back. Really nice to see him. We saw some good. We saw some bad. He needs a little bit of calibration, and he'll go again in the Milwaukee series. Excited for that. The Mets jumped out to a 3-0 lead in the second inning off spot starter Jonathan Diaz. Tomas Nito, runners in scoring position machine, especially with two outs. He gets a two-out RBI single, and then Canna hits a double with the bases loaded to make it 3 nothing Mets. Peterson came in shockingly enough to round out the McGill start. He went two and two thirds innings. So they combined for six innings, three earned runs. McGill and Peterson combined for a quality start. That's pretty good. Uh, Brandon Nemo, first home run in a while for him. He homers in the fourth to make it four to two Mets. Pete Alonso steals a base in the fifth. I threw together a little compilation because Pete Alonso has never been caught stealing in his career. He's seven for seven, eight for eight if you want to count the all-star game, which I think is fun. And then the Mets get some distance in the sixth inning off Jimmy Herget. Nemo doubled home two runs. Canna followed with an RBI single. These two had a game in game one. They went four for eight combined, two runs, 
six RBI and two walks. Brandon Marsh had a home run off Peterson in the sixth, but that would be the Angels' last run as Drew Smith, Joely Rodriguez, Adam Adovino, and of course Edwin Diaz shut out the final three innings for a decisive 7-3 win for the Mets. They get started on the right foot. Very nice. Big shout out to Tyler being back. Great to see him on the mound. He looked better than I anticipated because he hasn't really had time to feel himself back into pitching, you know, at the big league level. Uh, so nice from him. Very impressed with Peterson coming out of the bullpen and, and looking solid kind of right off the bat. Again, not the easiest thing to do. It's a different life, uh, different prep work. You never know uh, where you go as a starter. You know everything ahead of time, maybe days in advance, and you prep yourself. And then in the bullpen, you're like, what? Wait, wait, wait. what? When am I? Well, now? Okay, I'm in. Uh, he looked really good. That was awesome. Nemo showing some pop. Uh, love it. And I, I want to give a shout out. I love Pete Alonso. Yeah. I really do. I love everything about his game. The fact that when he does steal a base, he gets it. He's five for five incredible that just shows you a baseball iq willingness to to attack when you need to sneaky he's like um like paul goldschmidt obviously has has speed he's stolen i want to say 30 bags once uh average is probably 15 he has a different level of speed but he does something that pete alonso does something that that only the best do and that's take it when he needs it and he sees it he knows he's going to be safe he takes it so you can't sleep on him or he's going to run away like you do with Yachty. But uh, great to see them back. Good first win after, you know, a little scariness in, in L.A. Uh, at the Chavez Ravine site. Now we're in Anaheim. It's, it's nice to get that first win. Yeah, I really liked what you said about the Alonzo stolen base thing because I feel like the surface level perception of it is like you got to be fast to steal bases. But it's kind of just about picking your spots and getting a good jump and knowing your opportunities when you see them. And like Alonzo is going to get compared to Goldschmidt all season long because these are the two best first basemen in the National League. There's no real doubt about it. Uh, And I think the more similar that they get, the better. Uh, So that's pretty cool. Yeah, man. Uh, You know, you you look at uh, this is again, I don't want to dive in it too deep. But you see what Pete Alonso does when nobody's looking at him. He's not the fastest guy, but he's smart and he can he can get it five for five. You look at a guy like Nimmo, who's blazing fast, sneaky, like even faster than you think he is. And he he's terrible at stealing bases. It's it's wild, but it's different. It's it's anticipation, whatever the case may be. That's when baseball IQ comes in. Shout out to uh, to Petey doing his thing, man. Hell yeah. All right. What happened in game two, Jer? Game give me, two. Give me the curse. Like every game is uh, <laughs> here to make your boy feel sad. But Unreal. we get into it. It's Cookie versus Lorenzen of Cincinnati fame. Now over to the West Coast. Um, after dominating in San Diego, will Cookie continue? Let's stay tuned and find out. Uh, after escaping the first, Lorenzen uh, allows two runners right at the top. Gets out of it. Bottom of the first. Up steps this guy named Otani, Rendon, RBI doubles right off the bat. 2 nothing Angels. Let's move that to the bottom of the third. 2 nothing Angels still. This kid from Jersey, kind of might have heard of him. His name is Mike Trout. Hits a home run. That makes it 3 nothing. Bottom of the fifth, this kid from Japan. <laughs> pops up, hits the two-run kind of homer. 5 nothing. All of a sudden... Cookie, who bounced, looked amazing in San Diego, looked very hittable in this game. That ends his day. He goes four and two thirds, nine hits, five earned runs. The one walk, which was the first batter of the game, I believe. Seven punches, the two big home runs. One to Otani, one to Trout. Don't blame me there. Those guys are kind of good, if you remember anything. Uh, That raises his ERA to 3.93, but it's five nothing after five. Uh, Bottom of the sixth. After cleaning up the fifth, Chase and Shree, or Jake Reed uh, and the fifth for Cookie, Andrew Velasquez puts a Jake Reed slider that left in the middle to deep center. This made me think that maybe those balls that weren't juiced in the beginning might be getting that mixed bag that you talked about because Velasquez is not the dead center kind of guy. But that put the Angels up six to nothing. Um, after a walk in steps, Mike Trout, who hits his second home run of the game. That guy's kind of good. I think we should pay attention to him. I think so. That makes it eight, nothing. We go to the top of the seventh, eight, nothing. Angels still JD Davis singles, Guillaume singles. Nito does a job, gets him over and in steps Aaron loop who K's Nemo to get two outs. And then Mark Canna doesn't allow loop to escape. We knock one across. It's eight, one angels. Bottom of the seventh, Jared Walsh, who already had a home, uh, single and a double, 
home runs off Chase and Shreve. We might note that later. Becomes nine to one, top of the eighth. Nine to one still. Pete Alonso hits his 17th home run of the season. Kind of a garbage time home run. Still awesome to watch. Still great for him. Staying locked in, never giving away that bat. That makes it nine to two. Bottom of the eighth. We talked about Jared Walsh. He sends a two run triple to get a cycle, to get it in a fashion where nobody was paying attention to it. It's still like, hey, did he hit a cycle? Yeah, he kind of did. Overshadowed by Trout's two homers, Otani homer. I really didn't notice until afterward. There wasn't really talk about it. Anyway, that makes it 11 to two, top of the ninth. We get a uh, run on a on a walk error kind of combination, and then Ip steps Khalil Lee. For me, the real highlight of the day is Khalil Lee gets his first home run in the big leagues. Uh, tip of the cap to you, sir. A three run shot makes it 11 to six in my game two misery. That was not fun to recap, but a lot of action. Uh, Mets never really had a chance. Cookie didn't look great, but not terrible. The bullpen looked not terrible or actual terrible, but also, you know, uh, but it was ugly. 11 to six. Shout out to Khalil Lee for his first big league homer. Yeah. So Jerry, I just did the quick math while you were recapping. You are eight and 11 in game twos this year. Cause that's what the Mets are doing. So not eight great. 11? Eight that 11. feels way better than an actually, like, I was kind of shocked. I was kind of better than what it feels like. It feels like I'm zero for 45 <laughs> in game twos, maybe like two for 50 when we okay. sweep. Yeah. I like that. It's, yeah. I mean, it hurts. Not that a ton a of great one to stuff. recap too. A lot not of a action, but all for the other team. I don't really want to talk about it too deep, but, uh, we saw some familiar faces. We saw Tony Two Bags, Anthony Rendon looking healthy finally, which is great for baseball. Uh, awesome teammate, by the way. Uh, he looked good. He hurt us a little bit. We, we didn't let Aaron Loop escape completely unscathed. Uh, weird to see him. I want to shout out to those City Connect jerseys. Yeah, I came around awesome. on them. That whole uniform, I love it. They look awesome. Yeah, that I was one the, of the better like, ones I saw. I like the the, like, not – you know, the, the stripes on the, the sleeves that are two different. They, like, I just thought they did an awesome job. Yeah, I mean, they looked fly. That's why they wore them two nights in a row, I guess, because they wore them for Sunday Night Baseball, too. Uh, Michael Lorenzen looked really good. I mean, I think that was kind of a flyer deal that the Angels took, and he's looked awesome. The dude is like Starling Marte level jacked, so it kind of makes sense. Only the right side. He's jacked on That's the true. left. Yeah, he, He's like uh, Nimmo jacked on the left, Marte jacked on his right hand, <laughs> his right arm. It's hilarious. The guy looks really good. He's yeah. He thought he was this two-way star, started a couple games at center field for the Reds, and then he went over to the Angels, and he took a peek at what a historic two-way star looks like in Shohei Otani, and he said, thank you, sir. I'll just be a pitcher. Yeah. Uh, and rightfully so. But he's done a great job, man. They need him. They need uh, Syndergaard to step up. They need all their starters to, to really, you know, because they dug themselves a hole with, like, that, that losing streak. So. There's plenty of season. Yeah, they looked pretty good, man. They Jared Walsh is as advertised. Mike Trout still the best player on the planet. Otani looked amazing. Um, they could play some ball, man. Yeah, I mean the Mets caught no breaks because Trout and Rendon came back in this series, and uh, it, they didn't look great. The lineup against uh, Lorenzen, they went one for nine with runners in scoring position. Jake Reed got knocked around, gave up a home run to Velasquez, which is not great. Uh, but Khalil Lee, good for him. First major league home run, first hit of the season, just the second of his career. So very cool for Khalil Lee. He got the call uh, in the wake of the Marte injury. Who knows how long he'll be around. So at least he got a, a highlight out of his uh, his short ride here. But, and his hair's getting long, looking yeah, good. Looks looking good. good there, Khalil. I was into it. He kept it tied up when, uh, when I was with him last year in, in spring, but he's kept it growing. I like it. Good for him. All right, game three. Game three. Let's get rid of that game two. Come back. Yes, sir. All right, so the Mets, they get their third Sunday night baseball game in as many weeks. I think five weeks, maybe. So they've been on a lot. Uh, and they take on the Angels in this one. Patrick Sandoval, one of my guys, I did a video on him in the offseason. I really liked what I saw from him on Sunday as well. Uh, it didn't start out well for our Mets. Angels grabbed four hits and a run off Walker in the first inning. It was looking a little dire pretty quick. Starling Marte finally back in the lineup. It seemed like forever, but it was only four games that he was out. Uh, he rejoins the Mets. He bats second, and he immediately makes an impact by tying the game with an RBI double in the third inning. J.D. Davis, who I haven't talked about power wise in a while, he smacked a two-run homer off, uh, excuse me, second inning home run 
off Patrick Sandoval to make it 2-1 Metsies. And then Taiwan Walker, after that shaky first inning, dominated the Angels. Six innings pitched, one earned run, six hits, one walk, ten strikeouts for Taiwan Walker. That's a season high on 97 pitches. He allowed just two hits and a walk in five innings after that shaky first. Nine whiffs with his splitter. That's his most since 2016, over five years. He struck out the side in the second, and he struck out Mike Trout in the fourth. Not an easy thing to do because I've heard that he's pretty good. You told me that. You gave me that intel. Marte, he raced home on an Alonzo ground ball in the seventh inning. Probably could have got out on a better throw, but Matt Duffy throws it away. Mets get an important insurance run to make it 3-1, to one, and then Pete Alonzo crushes his 18th home run of the year. That leads the National League, second in MLB, only to Aaron Judge. It's a solo shot off Rysel Iglesias in the ninth to make it 4-1. to one. The bullpen was awesome. Seth Lugo kind of fell from the wayside because of what happened after, but he goes an inning and a third without allowing a hit. Just one walk, and then Edwin Diaz enters with some trouble and he has arguably what I think is his greatest outing as a New York Met on the primetime stage on national TV. He gets five strikeouts for all five outs of his five-out save. He strikes out Mike Trout and Jared Walsh with two runners on in the eighth inning, and then he mows down the side in the ninth to record his 12th save, lowers his ERA to 2.13 on the season. Sounds like an all-star to me. Maybe that's just me. Who knows? Mets go one for nine with runners in scoring position. They leave 11 men on base, but they beat a team that I think that they're better than. They win 4-1, to one. multi-hit games for Marte, Alonzo, J.D., and McNeil. A very solid team win, a very important team win to go 5-5 five and five on this West Coast trip from hell. No more West Coast trips for the rest of the year, not until September do we play a game that starts later than 8 o'clock, which I absolutely love because I think uh, <laughs> my sleep schedule got completely messed up by these past two weeks. So the Mets win, they take the series, and now they're back home finally. Oh, that was a great game. Great job. Good Thank recap. You. I enjoyed that very much. Um, a couple of things. Number one, Edwin Diaz. Whew. Wow. 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 That was absolute in fuego. I, I wanted to break out the trumpets myself. Um, that was special, man. That is, I mean, the word elite doesn't even do it we saw what Mike Trout is capable of. He's, he's a mythical creature. He's like the Loch Ness monster, the Yeti, whatever the case may be, how great he is. He dominated Mike Trout. It didn't dominate it. I was scared. Anyone would be pitch. scared. It's Mike Trout, but Edwin Mike Diaz Trout. was up. I to love it. everything about what he did because he did a few things. We talked about every time I talk about Edwin Diaz, we talk about how quickly he's been able to make adjustments. It's him getting to glove side, being able to, bury that fastball to glove side. And even more important, he's able to throw that slider off the plate away or even off the plate down in a way when it's ideal. So he throws a first pitch slider, which wasn't a, it was a, a solid one middle, but it had some depth, had that good break, took it for strike one. The next one, he just unleashes fastball like one Oh one and shout swings through it battle. Oh, two, but this is the pitch that got it for me. He threw a slider off the plate away about this far but it was just like that fastball off the plate away. I was like, he's locked in. He's able to get to glove side that far. Then he threw that what 101 again, just right by Trout. Uh, incredible. Just an absolutely electric. I don't, there's, there's nobody. There's no closer. I'd rather have. Yeah. There's no closer. It's a fact. Like I got to watch class a pitch in Cleveland special hundred yeah. plus with cutters. Uh, Josh Hader is still probably the number one guy. He did get hit around a little bit, gave up a couple of home runs, but when Edwin Diaz looks like that, he's, he's untouchable. I mean, Edwin Diaz has faced a hundred batters this season and he struck out 48 of them. Like that is an insane metric. There is no better officially. There's no better strikeout pitcher in baseball than Edwin Diaz. And that's exactly what we needed. We needed five strikeouts in a row, uh, especially in that eighth inning against Trout and Walsh. I mean, the Walsh at bat, he gets three fastballs, one at a hundred, one at 100.5 and one at one of two. Like, what do you do? You can't hit that. There's no way you're touching that. And it was like down the dick on the one Oh two for the strikeout. You can't like, that is just a different level of pitcher. And we t there's been a lot of discussion about that trade. Yeah, I know. Kalenix is going to be a good player. They shipped off Dunn to get those two Reds players, which is a good trade for them. 
But I said it on Twitter, and I'm going to say it here as well. This is a next man up team where somebody's stepping up to replace a void and fill in a hole. And I think that can apply to pretty much every area of this team, even the starting rotation where we lost two, you know, perennial aces. But the one guy that has no one behind him that can even come close to that production and that talent is Edwin Diaz. He is the most irreplaceable person on this roster, in my opinion, and he showed it in full force on Sunday. And I, I, I was, I had such a smile on my face that a national audience got to bear witness to what he did to those Angels hitters. It was. Crazy. I agree. I felt good for him on that national stage. Uh, I was happy to, that that. I mean, I always think about this. I look at all the competitive teams, the the teams that are going to be in the postseason. And I look at the Dodgers and who they have Hudson as their closer. Yeah. I'm going to take Diaz. And so would they, you got the Braves who are playing great baseball. They have Kenley Jansen. Who's very good. Great for a career right now. I'm, I'm taking Diaz. Yeah. 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 You got the the Phillies. We talked got, like maybe you want Hater. Maybe there's one pitcher in baseball. Hater, right I think now. it's still an argument, but I, I mean, it's not a, it's not as cut and dry. You got the Liam Hendricks and the White Sox having some struggles. You've got who's, who's closing for the Cardinals. Is it Cabrera? Uh, it's, it was a little bit of Cabrera, Giovanni Gallegos. So they they have got good to. guys, but not one. Yeah. And here, here's a, another thing before, I don't want to close the book on, on game three, because there's a couple of things I want to talk about, Sure. but yeah. Buck Showalter, man, everybody was nervous because he's an older guy stuck in his ways. Maybe that was kind of the, the, the gist of things um he he had diaz throw an eighth inning and now he gets a five out save now you don't want to do this ideally but he understood in this moment that that was necessary we needed this win we needed to, to go five and five on the road slam the door we have a closed. visitor we have a visitor nice i'm for it uh who who we got it's jimmy you can't you're on my zoom camera but he just showed yeah. his face here there he oh hey jimmy good to see you my friend <laughs> The 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 Hefe's in. Yeah, but he's in. Buck Showalter has shown an ability and the guys to to be adaptable. He's the moment he's never set in his ways. He's looking all the way down to the to October, and he's also in the moment at the same time. So he's asking guys to do a lot, but not too much. Give you a break. I, I, I've been so impressed, and and there was a lot of things to love, but Buck Showalter being adaptable, adaptability uh, has been huge. Yeah, I um I was really hoping to see Edwin in the eighth because I was worried that Buck might have got scared off by not using Edwin in the ninth when Lugo blew the save against the Dodgers. But I think that, you know, we have a very smart manager, a very sensible manager that knew, one, you put in your best relief pitcher against the core of the lineup. That's obvious. Two, Edwin hasn't pitched the whole road trip. He has plenty of gas in the tank. You got to trust him in that scenario. And it's not like Edwin threw that many pitches because he was just dominating the Angels. You obviously don't plan for that. But at the same time, I I'd fully agree that I think Buck executed the bullpen usage perfectly in the series. Yeah, a couple things from game three. Yep. Uh, Lugo looked great. Taiwan Walker, the punch out king. Who knew? Amazing. If he he hasn't been doing that all year. He's been he's been the the efficient guy, the like, you know, minimum K's, but he looked incredible. Uh he's been like, I can't overstate how good he's been. We've needed him and Cookie, and they both have been amazing since since the beginning of the season, but especially when the guys went down uh, and this lineup, man, this lineup was great. You know, I think as you start out with, it's, it's almost unhittable. You got n- or unstoppable Nemo, Marte, Lindor, Alonso, Canna, Escobar, JD, McNeil, Nito. That is an amazing lineup. And we talked about Nito's the, the weak link hitting 245 there. No, he's not. Runners in scoring position. This son of a gun is Babe Ruth. Oh wait, I gotta, I gotta, sh- I gotta pull up this number really quick because I, uh, we, we know that we know by now, listeners of the show, we know that Tomas Nito is a phenom with runners in scoring position. But, There's been a bunch of talk about Francisco Alvarez coming up, and yeah. the number one job is to catch this amazing pitching staff and be good on defensive side. And then Nito has come up clutch. You know, we don't need him to hit home runs. So stay down, get your, get your reps in, earn some experience. Nito, two outs, runners in scoring position, seven for 15. Pretty freaking good. That's a, that's amazing. That's beyond pretty good. Taiwan strikes out 10 in the start. He had seven K's in his last three starts combined. The splitter was just working. And when it's working, Taiwan becomes a different pitcher. And that was really like, 
You know, I think last year when Taiwan had that really incredible first half and he made the all-star team, a lot of eyes were on him because he was basically the number two of the staff when DeGrom went down. Um, now he's like quietly lurking in the back end and he had to step up in the wake of DeGrom and Scherzer going down. I think not having as much pressure on him, but at the same time still feeling like you have an important role in this rotation. I've just really enjoyed watching Taiwan thrive. And like I say it every single time he starts, but I mean, last seven starts, one home run allowed. When Taiwan is able to keep the ball in the ballpark and keep it on the ground with that nasty splitter, he just becomes a much more successful pitcher, and I think he's just built for this great Mets defense that has his back the entire way through. Obviously, you take 10 strikeouts to the bank when you get it from Taiwan Walker, but he can still be successful without it, and I think that's the really important takeaway, so that when he hits that level with his splitter and it's just working and fooling hitters, he has that capability to be elite, and that's what we saw on Sunday. Yeah, I, I want to and highlight him. I love it. Uh, I want to highlight J.D. Davis as well, yeah. who looks perfect in perfect form great to see he's got good he's taking the ball well he's tracking it he's he's driving it this is the jd davis that we were hoping to see um he seems pretty locked in man so that's that's exciting yeah crazy stat considering you know jd's been playing much better of late i think he's hitting 367 in his last 14 jd leads all mlb hitters in hard hit percentage he's been hitting into a lot of tough outs this season for sure but 64.6 that's better than jordan alvarez that's better than shohei otani that's better than some of the most elite baseball players in the game right now jd davis is at the top that's pretty cool yeah it's incredible and again it's a shout out to to buck show alter putting these guys in advantageous positions to be successful uh and it takes a great player like jd davis to thrive in those opportunities and to keep persevering uh, so this this team looks great. Again, the people are talking about oh, after the split in in LA, you know what? Woe is us. Are we are we panicking now? Uh, guy had a couple of scares with the the hit by pitch, and then then Marte pulling up kind of lame. Um, no need to panic. No need to look over your shoulder either. This is a long season. This is a Mets team that's looked for the World Series from the jump. The division isn't the 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 end all be all. It looks great for us at what five and a half games right now. Yep. Or but five the Braves are playing night. a lot better. The Braves are gonna be good. We knew that going in. Um, and the Phillies have turned it around since they fired Girardi. Um, have looked really, really good. They're gonna be formidable. And the Marlins have one of the best pitching staffs in baseball. So Whatever the case may be, it's this is way too early to be looking over your shoulder. Let us do it and talk about it, but don't worry about your Mets. They're going to be worrying about themselves, what they have to do, because nobody can touch them. Only they can affect themselves. If they think about it like you're a sprinter on a track and you're in first, as long as you keep your head looking forward and, and keep your pace, you're going to be fine. It's the when you start to look back that you can trip yourself up and then you have to like sprint and, and get out of your form. So they're doing their thing. We will take a look at the big picture. They're only worrying about the Mets. I promise you that. Yeah. And I think that we just got through maybe maybe the toughest part of our schedule for the entire year and you survived it. You went five and five. Uh, take it to heart. Feel good about it. You still got a nice lead. Uh, here's a big thing. Uh, the Mets had a lead in the NL East when Scherzer initially went down on May 18th, so nearly a month ago. Their lead on that day was six games. Their lead a month later, without Scherzer, still without DeGrom, is five games. They've lost a game in the standings without the ace of their staff. I think you you see that at the time and you take that to the bank. Obviously, it's been a roller coaster ride throughout that stretch. Uh, but Mets fans, you should be feeling good about the place that we're at now because I think you know the heat is going to die down a little bit. You got some home games coming up, an easier stretch to end June, and then you're almost coasting into the All Star break with a, a nice lead in the AL, uh, the NL East. Excuse me. Uh, we got the apple of our eye coming up. We got a series looking forward coming up. But first, I got to tell you guys about the sponsor for today's episode, which is of course the DraftKings Sportsbook. Guys, it's time to step up to the plate with the DraftKings Sportsbook, the official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. New customers can bet just $5 on any game and get $150 in free bets no matter what, win or lose. So if you're looking to turn another small bet into a big payday this baseball season, you can do so with DraftKings Same Game Parlays. Create your own parlay, uh, including stuff like which team will win, total runs, extra innings, which is kind of a fun one, and you have a shot at an even bigger payout. Uh, 
Right now, if you play, if your same game parlay doesn't hit, you can get a free bet back up to $10, which is pretty cool. Nice little forgiveness there. And DraftKings is safe, secure, and reliable. And best of all, you can deposit and withdraw your cash whenever you want. I actually got a decent payday over the weekend because I bet on the Braves and Phillies to win. I was trying to counteract them a little bit, trying to counteract the curse. I was like, all right, if they win, I get some money. If they lose, then they lose. And I'm happy about that. They won, obviously, because they're on some crazy winning streaks right now. But, you know, that's an easy parlay. Get yourself some grub there. Uh, So download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. Use promo code JOHNBOY. New customers can make any $5 MLB bet and get $150 in free bets no matter what. That's promo code JOHNBOY only at DraftKings Sportsbook, the official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. Minimum age and eligibility restrictions apply. uh, See show notes for details and MLB trademarks are used with permission. All right. I think that it's officially time for the apple, Jerry. The apple of our eye. The apple of my eye. (sighs) This is a good one. There's a a few things I want to highlight. J.D. Davis we talked about. He was incredible. Pete Alonso just being super Pete. Um, You didn't put it in the notes, but uh, he did have that stolen base. Oh, I got to add that in. That's okay. Got it. Um, great to see Nimmo back. Oh, you're adding it as we speak. Well, I he like deserved it. it. He earned it. Uh, I agree. <laughs> uh, Taiwan Walker with, with the big outing. But for me, the only option as a bullpen guy myself there it is. is the fireman. It's the trumpets. It's Edwin Diaz, the apple of my eye. Very, very deserving. Edwin has one, one other apple this year, and that was finishing the no-hitter. But I think this one is an all-timer. This is him at his best. This is him on a national stage announcing his presence, uh, dominating the best player on the planet. Two and two-thirds innings, had the one save, zero hits, one walk, seven punch outs. Seven. And just pure electricity. Um, Just making every other competitive team jealous by what we got to see erasing any doubt of of the back end of that bullpen uh just pure dominance he made me just feel bad like feel good i went to bed and i was like oh nice and cozy (laughs) just knowing that he's going to be back there he's like just a security blanket man i felt great apple of my eye mr edwin diaz very very good apple much deserved i'm very happy you picked him because if you didn't i definitely was going to uh, he's been everything as advertised. He has the highest K per nine in baseball, 17.05, which is a crazy mark. And he's the 17.05. F- like, that's ridiculous. That's and he's ridiculous. He is the first Met in their entire franchise history to record a five out save and strike out every single batter along the way. Okay. Pretty funny. I mean, cool. that's, you know, that's yeah, a, just a, a random thing, but yeah. also really cool. I mean, come on. It's pretty good. <laughs> it was very good. So you go Diaz. I think we're going to do two pitchers today. I mean, we had okay. a, we had a good offensive series. Nemo goes three for 12, double home run, three RBI. Alonzo, four for 13, two homers. Canna goes four for 11, two doubles, four RBI, four walks for Canna. I thought you might go Canna there because he was, he was you know, very good in his very Mark Canna-like. So did was there a little bit of word of him maybe wanting to be Canna? Oh, is that real? I don't know. So uh, my, you talked about Vince, Vince Catronio, my yeah. neighbor. He's like, is that true? He wants to be Kana. Mm. I'm like, but the H is after the N and also you're already a guy. Like, can you do yeah. that? Like it's kind of late to switch, man. You're a I, guy guy. So I, until further, you know, notified it's Kana. Yeah. And also so, Kana sorry. leads the way for more puns, like more, you know, nicknames and jokes. Like I think I'm sticking with Kana. Okay, cool. Unless he makes a fuss of it. Then I'll, then the I'll Piranha switch. Mark Kana? Ooh, okay, maybe not. Maybe we do need to switch. I don't know. <laughs> I don't really think of a Piranha when I think of Mark Kana, though. Or Mark Kana, excuse me. Well, that's <laughs> it's the name. You would. He does not get my apple. J.D. Davis also went 5 for 12. Good for him. My apple goes to Taiwan Walker for his Sunday night baseball performance. Taiwan. Had uh, a lot asked of him. He had a tough start to the season. He got injured in his first start against the Phillies. Had to face the Phillies, I think, like four times in his first, like, six starts. That's a tough turn for him. Came back uh, in the wake of the Scherzer injury and kind of was asked to step up. I mean, Chris Bassett hasn't really had it. Tyler McGill was injured. David Peterson, you know, still getting his bearings in the MLB. Tywin Walker was looked upon as sort of a stable of this Mets rotation. 
And when they needed a big outing from him against Patrick Sandoval, who had a pretty good outing himself, that is exactly what he delivered. After that shaky first inning, he rounds it out. Six innings, one earned run, 10 strikeouts for Taiwan. I think that's his most as a Met. Uh, Splitty was just working. And, I mean, don't look now. Really don't look now, but he's got a 3.08 ERA in 10 starts. He is approaching that same level first half that he had last year where he had the 2.8 at the All-Star break, made the All-Star team. And I think he's learned a lot in a year's time uh, when that second half kind of got away from him and the second half got away from the Mets as a whole. I think he's a much better pitcher than what we saw last year. He's even more dangerous than he was. And now he's got plenty of backup along the way. McGill is back. Scherzer is inching his way closer. DeGrom is on the horizon. Uh, He won't be looked at as that number two anymore. And having a guy like Taiwan Walker at year five is just absolutely lethal. This Mets rotation is only going to improve in the coming weeks. And Taiwan Walker really helped us stabilize and keep things sane and cool for those uh, four weeks that people have been gone. So he gets my apple, very deserving, and and just an awesome stretch for Taiwan Walker in general. So he gets my apple. I love it, man. He's so good. Uh, Another thing is he's... He's impossible to read on the mound. He shows zero. He's stoic. He doesn't like, I'm, you know, after he got hurt, I watched the game when he got injured and you're like, oh, you didn't see anything. And so then the, when he came back, I'm like, I'm looking for it. He doesn't, he doesn't change demeanor with whatever's going on. That is a special specimen to be able to do that. To, to It's not emotionless. It's inner confidence, which is awesome. Uh, but I mean, he's, He's doing it, man. I can't tip of the cap, man. What a, what a, that first half last year, this, he's doing it in a different way with that splitty. Um, this looks sustainable to me. You know, obviously the second half has been kind of his downfall for career in a sense, and especially last year. Um, I think we're going to build off of it and with Buck and everybody in, in tow. Um, I think they're going to manage it. So I'm excited. Good for him. Yeah, and well I think deserved. like the the whole response to adversity thing, because his start in San Diego, you know, four runs pretty early on, and then he rounded out, gave them at six, kept them in the game. They didn't win that game. But at the same time, if Taiwan lets that thing spiral, it becomes way out of reach way quicker. And I think that's just as important. You know, you're going to have starts where you give up four and six, you give up five and four, whatever. As long as you can give your chance, uh, give your team a chance to stay in the game, I think that's extremely valuable. And this Mets offense has proven that they can come back with the best of them. Uh, so Taiwan Walker having a great season. Very happy for him. Friend of the company as well. So that's pretty cool. Oh, yeah. All, All right. right. There you go. So uh, what do we got coming up, dude? We We're got finally the Brewers. Home. The Brewers coming into town. Milwaukee, they're on a little bit of a little down slope here. I think the Cardinals finally overtook them in the Central. They leaped them. They look like a juggernaut coming in. It's our boy Trevor Plouffe picked them to, oh, yeah. to represent the AL. Them and the White and Sox, both tough seasons, man. Tough, Oof. tough. And we were picking both teams in Central. I picked both of them as well. Um, they're kind of in scramble mode, but... In game one, we're going to see Chris Bassett against Adrian Hauser. Chris Bassett looking for a big bounce back. Really said some things in this post game. First of all, thank you for being so forthcoming, Chris Bassett, and how you're how you're feeling emotionally, being being representative and and not giving us you know BS. Um, said he's kind of lost for words. He's like, I've never been this guy before. I don't know what to do. Scary, but thank you for telling us. And we're we'll be watching you. You know, with a microscope looking for you to bounce back i believe in him um i think i talked to obviously being with the a's this past weekend his old stomping grounds um their pitching coach mentioned something to me that i think that they've been back and forth a little bit so i think there might have been a little bit of of mechanical issues but looking for him to bounce back omar narvaez uh of the brewers is five for seven with two rbi against bassett everyone else on that roster combined is a one for 23 so that's Pretty darn good. Uh, Adrian Hauser is allowed 11 earned runs and five homers in 15 innings pitched in his last three starts. That's not so good. Uh, but also, here's Chris Bassett with 22 earned runs and seven home runs allowed in 26 in- innings pitched in his last five. So both of these guys looking for a bounce back. Um, let's just hope it's our boy who yeah. bounces back quicker. He needs it. Yep. That brings us to game two. David Peterson will be towing the rubber uh, and his sparkling three ERA back in the rotation. He'll be going against the reigning NL Cy Young Award winner, uh, Corbin Burns and his 2.48 ERA. Um, Nimmo and Alonso are both three for six against Burns, which is really good. Only McCutcheon 
has a hit against Peterson, who's one for 11 with a home run. Peterson appeared in relief to complete McGill's outing and has six earned runs in his last 11 innings pitched. Kind of a weird fluky thing, but he looks sharp. Burns has allowed six earned runs and six walks in eight innings pitched in his last two starts. Before that, he had a 195 through the end of May. Um, Corbin Burns looked shaky his last couple outings. Like this whole team has been kind of uh, wobbling, if you will, a little bit off axis. Um, they're going to be looking to bounce back. I expect Corbin Burns to be special. So it's going to take something to beat him. Game three, Tyler McGill, his second one back with his 4.5 ERA going against Aaron Ashby, double A, 3.91 ERA. Narvaez, Yellis, and Adames have all homered off McGill. Different form of McGill, so we'll see. And the Mets are inexperienced 0 for 2 against Aaron Ashby. Not a lot of uh, experience against him. Uh, he's allowed 10 earned runs, 19 hits, and 10 and two-thirds innings pitch over his last two starts. And McGill will be stretched out to 70, 80 pitches in a second start back from the I.L. Through 64 and three and a third. Again, he looked solid, looked strong. I expect him to build off of that last outing facing a what I would consider lesser lineup than what he faced in Anaheim moving forward. And that's our three-game set. Very nice, serious outlook as always, Jerry. Yeah, these Brewers. They're kind of spiraling. They lost three or four to the Padres. They got swept by the Phils, and they lost two or three to the lowly Nationals very recently. They also had yesterday off, so they had a, a day to collect themselves maybe and calibrate. A couple things I want to note. Uh, yeah, game one is the one I have my eye on for sure. Obviously, want Bassett to bounce back, have a good start. It's kind of between him and Hauser. They both really are kind of reeling recently, and they need uh, a good start to hopefully kick things into momentum. I think the Mets are getting Corbin Burns at maybe the best possible time of the year. I mean, he looked absolutely dominant in April and May, really pushing the envelope on a second consecutive Cy Young. But his last two starts, the Phillies got to him, which was pretty shocking. Uh, Padres got to him as well. They're a good team. Not a great offense. I was a little bit shocked by that as well. The six walks in those last eight innings is very perplexing to me. That is that is a sign that something's off with yeah. Corbin Burns. So we'll see if he's got that control. You'll know pretty early. Uh, what version you're going to get either way it's still going to be tough because he's still got electric stuff so yeah and this is a Mets team that has great on base numbers works great counts and draws a lot of walks so I think that works right into their wheelhouse hopefully he's still a little bit shaky for them as well Tyler McGill I'm interested to see how long he goes in this outing as well uh, he looked good I agree uh, in his start obviously he didn't get to go very deep and he was facing a pretty good top half of that lineup very top heavy in general are the Angels yeah these Brewers starters man this is known as a pitching team and the pitching is just slumping right now and when the offense isn't clicking like it usually does for the Brewers uh, this is what will happen they're, they're having a June swoon of their own where they're I think two and ten now. Uh, so it's been rough for I them. I like that. June yeah. swoon. And they, it's not going to get easier for them. After us, they have the Reds, which is a little break. But then they got Cardinals, Blue Jays, and Rays right after this. So this is kind of like make or break time for the Brewers. And the Mets uh, are going to want to bury them a little bit further and, I guess, help out the Cardinals in turn. Yeah, I mean, it's not make or break. It's still June. No, it's no. still, yeah, they need to they need to start playing some some baseball here, though, if they, if they want to remain competitive. The NL Central is really a two-horse race with them and the Cardinals. The Cardinals aren't amazing either though. And they're going to, they're going to be punching, you know, back and forth. It's going to be that that's going to be a fun race to watch down the stretch. I think, especially if Milwaukee's playing like this, St. Louis is really good. They're going to be really good. They're always competitive. Uh, this is supposed to be Milwaukee's time to own the central. Uh, they're going to need to step up and, you know, Hauser they're going to need, but they're burns. They need to be at his peak level the same way the, the, the Phillies need Zach Wheeler to be Zach Wheeler. They need Corbin Burns to be himself. Right. Like, like they have guys around him for sure. I think Eric Lauer had a really good start to the season. He kind of had a bad uh, start recently. It's just this, this lineup kind of turning a corner a little bit, but still not really where you want them to be. Rowdy Telez is having a good season. Omar Nervais, one of the most underrated catchers in baseball. But Kutch hasn't really been doing it. He had a really slow start to the season. Lorenzo cain has been rough out there. Uh, Yelly is still just kind of trying to recapture that magic a little bit. He's about league average right now. Uh, so if this pitching is slumping, this is a prime opportunity for the Mets, who did score a lot in that Angels series. and was We kind of overshadowed it with our own Apple choices just because Sunday night they pitched extremely well. Uh, but this Mets offense is looking good. J.D. Davis is really hitting his stride. Alonzo is obviously Alonzo. 
Big key factor for me is I need to see uh, Francisco Lindor turn a corner. It's been kind of a quiet June for him, slumping his OPS back down to around that 750 mark where he's kind of just been bouncing around this entire season. He's been kind of hot and cold, and I'm hoping this series is one that kind of clicks for him and he can get it going again. That'll be nice. We'll need him down the stretch. We don't we don't need him like we did last year to carry the load, play great defense, and just relax at the plate and do your thing. Um, for the Brew Crew, you mentioned Narvaez, who's – who's doing really well. Victor Caratini, um, also the other catcher, has been hitting really well. Uh, but Rowdy Telez, their they're big, you know, their big first baseman, uh, he's been really good for them, the 780 slug or OPS. Um, Willie Adames is always a danger for me. He's a, he's a special kind of player, their shortstop, kind of their, their heartbeat, one of those guys. And Yelich is, they've been, they need Yelich really bad to kind of, return to a little bit of form because he was if you look back on those years that he had when he first came over to Milwaukee he had a MVP and then you know got broke his kneecap on a foul ball and was second in MVP voting he hasn't been the same since that injury so I hope it's not forever because I love Yelly's game uh, and I think he's a great guy Um, but they're gonna need him so this pitching staff of ours the Mets can really take advantage of some of their holes. Lorenzo Kane looks like he's gotten a little bit older. Um, but really, this is their 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 heart, you know, their their bread and butter is pitching. And they've been struggling. Corbin Burns, Adrian Hauser, Hauser's been, you know, a, not lackluster, but but average. Um, so yeah, man, it's and we saw people get to hate her. Yeah. So who's shown a, a little bit of vulnerability. Those Phillies got to hate her. They've been red hot. Uh, the Brewers also lost Woodruff and Peralta, so they're without them right now. Still a solid rotation outside of those guys. Uh, but they just find bullpen magic everywhere they go. They obviously have Hader at the back end, Devin Williams with that wicked changeup. And then two guys, Hobie Milner and Brad Boxberg, are both with ERAs under three through 25 games. I did not have that on my report card. Uh, I didn't either. Uh, just saying the name Hobie is uh, good <laughs> enough for me. I love that. Hobie Milner, That is yeah. a that is not... An 1886 person, that is a person in 2022. I love it so much. Also, I think the best part of this team is a starter that we're not going to face, whose name is Jason Alexander, who is George Costanza from Seinfeld, which I absolutely love. <laughs> I love it. But Hobie, Hobie Milner, I just I want to look him up. He's, he's, he's only 31. He's not 142. Ah, we should get you a Hobie uh, Milner jersey. Oh, I, I might rock a Hobie Milner. That's a great name. That sounds like, to me, somebody that's like in the Hall of Fame that you see their number retired, uh, their name there, and you're like, oh, Hobie Milner. Classic. You know? Love Hobie Milner. If he, were, if he were a pitcher, he had like 45 complete games every year. <laughs> uh, just <laughs> that kind of era of baseball. I love it. It's awesome. Hobie. <laughs> it's awesome. You're on one now. You can't get it out I of I love head. it. <laughs> All right. I think... I think that'll do. All right, we're done. <laughs> You're so happy, game, man. Let's 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 root for Jerry for game two. Let's do it. Come on, man. We need a big win in game two. It's about time. We Ooh. do. Peterson versus Burns. The odds are not in your favor. I'm just gonna be straight up. They're hey, not. Hey, that's okay. That's okay. I, I'm I'm I liked being the underdog. Yeah. I'm for it. You're thriving, man. <laughs> I'm thriving. All right, guys. We will be back on Friday to talk Mets. For Jolly, I'm Jerry. Let's go Mets! For Jerry, I'm Jolly. Let's go Mets. See you guys soon. Take care. Normal start times. 7 p.m. No more 10 p.m.